Well, folks, I am so happy to have you join us this evening. Uh, my name is Kate Bartholomew. I'm chair of the Atlantic chapter of the Sierra Club. And I'm pleased that we have with us tonight, Dr. John Stoltz, uh, Lauren Batichek, and uh, Dr. Raymond Vaughn, all are going to be speaking on fracking waste landfills and leachate. And I'm probably certain that I butchered Lauren's last name and I didn't mean to, um, but um, uh, Dr. Stoltz and Lauren um, did their research from um, in, in part due to the funding from my Park Foundation grant and um, uh, Dr. Vaughn was um, working with us in the uh, Finger Lakes group uh, based on um, the Hakes landfill in uh, Steuben uh, and its many uh, permutations of expansion. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stoltz and Lauren. Well, thank you very much, Kate. And it's a pleasure for us to be here and share some of our results. Uh, it is with some humility and, and uh, I wouldn't say disappointment, but uh, you know, the, the happy news was getting the word from the Park Foundation that they would actually support this work. And then we had COVID. And so uh, travel restrictions and whatnot limited so, uh, to a certain extent, to a very large extent, our ability to, um, you know, to sample as much as we wanted to. But Lauren did an amazing job, and that's where she's going to um, have the lion's share of the, the spotlight tonight to share her, her research. But, uh, you know, full disclosure, I grew up in Syosset, New York. So I am considered a native New Yorker, but I've spent the last 31 years here in Pittsburgh, the Iron City. And uh, honestly, didn't think that I'd be working on uh, the resurgence of the oil and gas industry. Um, but uh, here we are. And so what we would like to do tonight is that I will give a brief, uh, actually, a presentation on uh, some of the background of why we're here, why we were interested in fracking waste landfills and leachate and what the connection is. Uh, Lauren will present her data that she's found working up in upstate New York uh, as we call it here. <laughs> and uh, then um, Dr. Vaughn will uh, discuss some of his results of what he's looked into uh, as far as the radiation situation at these landfills. Uh, after my and Lauren's uh, presentation, we'll have a, a, a Q&A session. And then Dr. Vaughn will have another Q&A session after that. And then we'll have a wrap, uh, um, wrap up. We're also joined by Rachel Trexler who is an attorney at law who is uh, representing a number of groups that are uh, trying to keep hazardous waste out of our landfills and more importantly, out of our environment, whether it's in New York or, or elsewhere. Okay, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, uh, you know, th this all started for me back in 2010 when I started learning about this thing called Marcella Shale. And this actually is, uh, Thanks to Kate, um, I did a couple of, I was part of a couple of forums uh, back in 2010 when there was discussions about whether or not New York State should actually start fracking. And yes, they have Marcellus and yes, they have Utica, but in both cases, they're uh, closer to the surface and uh, actually they're named after two towns in New York, Marcellus and Utica. And so when I was at the, um, one of the uh, symposia, I asked, can, is there any place closer than Marcellus to find it? And sure enough, in Lodi, New York, there's a, a quarry up there. And this is an actual picture of the Marcellus Shale. Now, the interesting thing is, and you can see my right hand up at the top there, um, it's not that radioactive. And the reason here is because it's been exposed so long that anything that might be radioactive has either leached out or degassed from the formation. But what we're talking about this evening is the fresh stuff, the stuff that's several thousand miles in many cases uh, underneath of the surface um, of the earth basically. And this is an example, this is what is required to now get this oil and gas from these shales. Um, and it's called fracking or it's a combination of horizontal drilling 
where they actually go out sideways after they've gone down vertically several thousand feet. Um, and then they use a combination of pressure and fluids, chemicals, and uh, fine grain sand called propen to prop open cracks in these rocks and release uh, the gas and oil. Uh, however, there's other stuff that comes up as well. And that's the, actually the focus of what we wanna talk about this evening. But uh, I like to say this is from Bob Donnan. I know he's in the audience this evening. Thank you so much, Bob. This is one of his pictures. He's been documenting shale development in the tri-state area for uh, over a decade now. But it, it's not his poor focus in the camera. That's actually propent that's, that's in the air. So these things are heavy industrial um, processes and, and an industry and uh, so again, but the focus of tonight is the waste and where it's winding up. And hopefully, and this has been the goal of my research is making sure that it's not winding up in our sources of drinking water, whether it's surface water or groundwater. Uh, this is an example. I happen to uh, be part of a documentary that was done back in 2010 and uh, got to go up in an, air, uh, an airplane and in, in a helicopter. And this is actually my photograph of a well pad, uh, pad early in development. But what you can see here uh, is what's actually being discharged from the drilling rig is both a combination of um, you know, rock fragments and uh, the drilling months that they've used to uh, uh, facilitate the, the smooth drilling. Uh, once the well is complete and goes into production, it actually, uh, some of those, fluids that they send down the, the hole actually come back up. And after a while, they've got enough time to spend in the rock formation itself. So they take on some of the characteristics. Now, this is, uh, again, one of my photographs. Um, I've uh, been able to visit a number of uh, well pads post-production because of the families that own the property and they wanted me to test their water and um, also check out their property. And this again is circa 2010, uh, before the link fences went up, and we realized how dangerous these pro these uh, operations are. You know, we were initially told it's like your grandfather's well, not a problem, it's safe. But if you look here, these are the what they call condensate tanks to collect those fluids that come up the hole along with the oil and gas. And as you can see here, they're actually hazard placarded, toxic and flammable for produced water and crude oil. And this is a well in Washington County in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the amazing thing is, is that in Pennsylvania and other places, once it goes through this magic hose and into the truck, it becomes residual waste or brine. And then it can be disposed of in a variety of different uh, ways. So uh, over the years, I've had, uh, thanks to the uh, kindness of strangers, uh, provided a series of different produced water. This is a particular series of produced water from uh, a well in the Bakken, which is in North uh, Dakota. But you can see the first 500 barrels looks pretty much similar to in composition to what they put down the hole. But after several months of production, each of these samples represents 500 barrels, which again, if you do the math, there's 42 gallons in, in a barrel. Um, it gets juicier and juicier. And so we've published several of our results in, in, I should say our results in several peer reviewed papers. This is just an example of um, the salt content in these things and this FB, this is the one from the Bakken. These three here are from, a Mar from Marcellus Wells. Uh, specific conductance, which is a basic ind uh, indicator of total dissolved solids. You can see they're in the tens of thousands of uh, milligrams per liter. Um, chloride levels, almost 100,000 or up to over 100,000 milligrams per liter. So it's incredibly salty. Bromide, again, high levels of bromide, why that's important. Well, it turns out at the end of the day, if this material gets into drinking water sources and public drinking water, it causes issues with um, the final uh, disinfectant uh, stage in which they chlorinate the water. And most 
uh, drinking water facilities chlorinate their water, that it produces the bromide and the residual organics produce uh, trihalomethanes, which are cancer causing compounds um, that are regulated by the EPA. And that'll be part of the story this evening as well. So these fluids are known for their high conductivity and salinity. They're also known for their metals. They have high uh, levels of lithium, barium, strontium, and can often have high levels of uh, calcium and magnesium, iron uh, and, and magnesium and manganese. Um, but again, barium and strontium are typical of these things. So here we look at this, the strontium levels here. These are the produced water samples. Um, you know, again, this is what I'm calling the flow back, which is the initial stages, not that much because it's more like what they put down the hole. But once it gets from production and these wells have been in production for uh, some time, these levels skyrocket. I mean, the calcium, 13,000 milligrams per liter. It's chunky stuff. Um, and radioactivity. And this is something that we've just rediscovered. It's been discovered multiple times. It's been known by the industry back way back even into the 60s. They knew that even conventional oil and gas drilling was producing waste that contained high levels of radium that when it combined with the strontium and the barium in the presence of sulfate would form what they call in the industry scale, which are these deposits. And that the strontium and the barium might not be hot, but the radium is definitely hot. And that comes in at least two common forms, radium 226 and radium 228. Radium-226 in particular has a half-life of 1,600 years. Now, these, again, I got a phone call. I, uh, I'm a trucker. I'm interested in having you analyze some of the samples I've been collecting over the years. Can you do that? And sure enough, these are different samples. Some of them aren't that hot. But again, this one from Thompson Road, it's a, a produced water from an impoundment. 7,300 picocuries of radium per liter. Now, more math, there's 3.8 liters in a gallon. So you actually, if you wanna know how many picocuries per gallon, you've gotta multiply it by 3.8. But again, the EPA standards, uh, US EPA standards are in picocuries. Anyway, hot stuff. And that was actually brought to light in a recent publication uh, back in 2020 by Justin Noble in Rolling Stone magazine. You know, as a kid growing up in New York, you always wanted to be on the cover of Rolling Stone. Well, anyway, I made it into Rolling Stone, but not on the cover. Nevertheless, it was basically saying that in Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Ohio, they were trucking this stuff to uh, injection wells in Ohio, because uh, Pennsylvania doesn't have that many. And, uh, but they were totally ignoring the fact that this stuff was radioactive. But we knew about this. Again, this is from a, a, an article that Ian Urbina did back in 2011, based on EP, uh, DEP data, our Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania, you know, high levels of gross alpha, high levels of uranium, and high levels of radium. Radium is the important one here because under aerobic conditions out in the open, uranium is insoluble but radium is soluble. So, you know, your uh, different places where this may be treated and where these uh, wastes are being treated, um, it's still gonna be soluble and in solution. Okay, so a little, uh, and Ray may go into this a little bit uh, in more detail later, but again, why do I stop here and say, okay, there's different types of radiation Obviously things like x-rays and whatnot, yes, that's a, a certain type of radiation. But when we talk about radioactive decay, we talk about three basic um, products, alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma radiation. And alpha, again, not to get too technical, it's a large particle because it's actually a helium nucleus, but it has two neutrons, two protons, and it will be blocked by skin or paper. But nevertheless, if you ingest or uh, inhale uh, something that's an alpha emitter, it's going to start bombarding your uh, lung cells or your uh, GI tract cells. Not a good thing. Beta particles, again, they're a little lighter. They go a little further, but again, they can be stopped by things like aluminum foil. Um, but again, and then they're either positive or negative because they're small particles. And um, 
you know, why that's important as well is because it really does matter what kind of emitter a radioactive substance is. And the last one is the gamma. And in many cases, even an alpha and beta emitter will also be a gamma emitter. Well, that's high energy and that'll blow right through you. So if you're standing in front of a gamma emitter, it may just go right through you. And you need like a lead shield or a large, you know, big chunk of cement. But uh, the issue here is once again, that gamma emission, because it's ionizing radiation will cause DNA damage, not something you wanna be exposed to. So that's the three different types of radiation that we're talking about. And the fact that a single um, radioactive substance may generate more than one type of emission. Now, what we have on the left here is that, you know, the parent um, element here is radioactive uranium. And this is what we call a decay pathway. So when going into its happy way to finally get down to a stable element, which is every element's goal <laughs> in principle is to decay until it's stable. It goes through this pathway. So here we go, uranium to thorium to radium. There we go, our radium, our soluble radium. Radon, which if you live in New York or Pennsylvania because of all our shale, uh, we have a concern of radon in our homes. Again, you don't wanna have high levels of radon in your home because it's gonna decay. And if you breathe in radioactive radon, over many, many years, your probability of getting lung cancer is greatly increased. Well, the interesting thing is radon itself, which has a you know, half-life of 3.8 days, decays to polonium-218. Uh, it also decays to polonium-214, polonium-210, through uh, various pathways, as well as lead-210. Now, the important thing here is every one of these daughter products, as we call them, are also radioactive. So this single radon is gonna generate these different uh, daughter elements, if you will. So this is part of the dynamic as well, because there's a fella in uh, uh, Ohio that wants to sell you a product made from oil and gas waste that has a lot of this radium in it, but he's gonna tell you it's, not, it's, it's as safe as your banana. Well, your banana is, has potassium-40 in it, which is radioactive, but it decays to calcium and argon, which are both inert and stable. So as your banana sits on your shelf rotting, <laughs> it's also getting colder, okay, simply put. Whereas this stuff actually gets hotter over time. And that's one of our concerns. All right, so to the landfills. Well, um, I think I'm going to go to the next slide, because this is where the story actually started for me. I found out that the drinking water facility in Charleroi, Pennsylvania, was in, in compliance for its uh, trihalomethanes. So I had a suspicion that maybe oil and gas waste were getting into their source water, which was the Monongahela. Well, it turns out that just upstream of that uh, drinking water facility was the uh, Bell Vernon uh, wastewater treatment plant. And that that, as I found out, that wastewater treatment plant was taking the leachate from the Westmoreland landfill that was taking oil and gas waste. And I found out further that Pennsylvania allows up to 80% volume per day for any sanitary landfill to take this oil and gas waste and totally ignores the fact that even though they have to go through radiation detectors, and the way that they test for, leach, um, for liquids is just with a pan Geiger counter six inches from the hole of the truck, that these things can be immobilized and all buried at the landfill. So what I found out was that this Westmoreland landfill had been taking this waste for, for uh, probably since the uh, 2012, 2014, that it was sending its leachate upwards of 100,000 to 300,000 gallons a day to the uh, Bell Vernon Municipal Waste Treatment, it was totally overwhelming the plant. And then when I got the phone call from the manager of the waste treatment plant saying, please come and test, I found out that the specific connectivity was high, the, the waste treatment plant was out of compliance for its um, NIPTES permit for discharge, but more importantly, that its discharge going into the Monongahela River had high levels of bromide and was radioactive. Now, this was on a good day because they heard I was coming. 
and they shut off the flow from the landfill to the waste treatment plant. But I was smart enough to check some of their sludges. And indeed, over time, these sludges were radioactive. So now we have a radioactive landfill, we have a radioactive waste treatment plant, and it's discharging this stuff into the Monongahela, which is having an impact on a drinking water facility downstream. Well, the happy news is that when this all broke in early 2019, um, the facility was able to get a restraining order. It needed a restraining order to stop the landfill from sending this stuff to it. And uh, I went back uh, a month later, a little over a month later, and sure enough, they were back in compliance and there was no detectable bromide and no detectable radiation. So we know it was the landfill. Now, why is this important? Because New York is doing the same thing. It's, it stopped and banned fracking but it's allowing its landfills to take this waste as well with no concern for the radioactivity and the buildup of that radioactivity over time. So um, Lauren is gonna talk about her results, but the other thing is, is just to give you guys a heads up that you know, in this innovation, there's this term that, that's used, it's called beneficial use, that these waste products are being put to quote unquote beneficial use. So I had mentioned earlier about this de-icer product that supposedly, who knows what study actually proved this, but 70% less corrosive than rock salt. It's safe for the environment and pets, and yet you have to keep it away from your kids. This stuff is called Aquasalina by nature's own. Sounds really, um, you know, green. But, and the, the primary ingredient is ancient seawater. Well, it's actually not ancient seawater. It's oil and gas waste. And if we look at the composition of this stuff, again, this stuff is showing up everywhere. We have, what do we see? We've got high chloride, we've got bromide, we've got arsenic, we've got high metals, and we've got radium 226 and 228. And then the remarkable thing is, as it sits on my shelf in my lab, it gets hotter. And this, every few months, I let it degas, I do it safely, okay? But this guy is a radon generator. And this is my um, Rad7, actually, Yuri Gorby uh, gifted me with it. But it basically is a radon detector for real-time radon. And you can see here, it says 145 picocuries of radon in that, that uh, five-minute sniff. So imagine, if you will, you know, your, your DOT with um, garages full of barrels of this material generating daughter products and getting hotter by the day. So as radium 226 decays, uh, it gets hotter because of the buildup of the daughter products. And here we're just measuring the radon. So again, is it cause for concern? Again, it all depends. And that's why I'm glad that Rachel's here because we have some, some street cred on, on just, you know, it, is this stuff really toxic? And the answer is, yeah. And thankfully, New York has passed um, legislation. It was signed uh, by your former governor back in August of 2020. Uniform treatment of waste, all waste resulting from the exploration, development, extraction, and production of crude oil and natural gas, including but not limited to drilling fluids and produced waters, shall be considered hazardous waste under the law of the state and subject to all person, pertinent generation, transportation, treatment, storage, and disposal laws and regulations if such waste meets the definition of hazardous waste set forth in the subdivision three of section, et cetera, et cetera. But are you protected? Well, we still don't know because in the bill, they were uh, your uh, regulators were given six months to come up with new regulations. So, okay, where we are. So I will end with what is the current impact and potential legacy of oil and gas waste and sanitary landfills, New York State and elsewhere? And we'll pass the baton to Lauren. We'll take um, questions and uh, Q and A afterwards. Thank you. All right, you ready to go, Lauren? Yes, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Okay, so I, my name is Lauren Bodicher. I've worked with Dr. Stoltz for about two years now, and we've been looking at um, the potential impacts of oil and gas waste on um, surface water 
um, landfill leachate in the environment at large. And I'll be going into some of the specifics of our study. Um, so what you see here is images showing essentially the basic life cycle, um, if you will, of these wastes. They're created by both conventional and unconventional um, oil and gas extraction. Um, the image on the left is showing you um, a facility in Pennsylvania. And we were looking at the waste being sent to landfills. In particular, the one in the middle is the Shimong landfill, which is one of the sites in New York that we've been able to find um, is taking this waste. And then finally, a lot of these landfills treat their leachate initially on site, but all of those in New York ultimately send it to wastewater treatment facilities, which treat it as part of their um, broader waste and then release it in their effluent to surface water, so things like lakes and rivers. Um, and just a bit of information on leachate, it's the fluid that's produced by both the breakdown of materials in the landfill, as well as rainwater percolating through, and it's collected um, by the landfills. And so it contains a bit of everything that's going into those landfills. So our study was in part um, spurred on by a report by Earthworks that looked at the amount of hydraulic fracturing waste produced between 2011 and 2018. Um, and it raised concerns about the potential impacts of these wastes. So we received funding from the Park Foundation to look at the potential impacts of oil and gas waste on landfills in New York. And we began by identifying landfills that were accepting oil and gas waste from Pennsylvania, and then determining the amount of both liquid and solid waste that they had taken over time. That information came from um, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, or PADEP's oil and gas waste report, as well as annual reports the landfills send to the New York um, Department of Environmental Conservation, as well as contacting the landfills themselves. We also spoke to landfills and requested um, that they allow us to test their leachate. Unfortunately, none of them were open to that. Um, so once we'd identified these facilities and determined that they were not gonna be open to us testing their leachate, we then identified the treatment facilities where they sent their leachate um, and pulled the state pollution discharge elimination system permits, um, also called NIPTES permits, um, for those wastewater treatment facilities so we could determine where their discharges were. And we identified potential environmental sampling sites upstream and downstream of those um, discharges. The purpose of having an upstream site was really to let us establish kind of a baseline water chemistry for whatever that source was. Um, and then we could compare it against the downstream to see, you know, were these discharges having an impact on the water chemistry. We collected both um, water samples as well as creek bed soil samples. And the water samples were analyzed for anions, um, cations, and light hydrocarbons, so methane, ethane, ethene, and propane. And then the um, creek bed soil samples were tested for the radium 226 and 228, which is one of those problematic um, potential contaminants coming from oil and gas waste. Um, an important note is, of course, this was going on during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that unfortunately limited what we were able to do um, because of some of Duquesne University's um, health restrictions. We weren't able to leave the state for most of 2020 and part of 2021. Um, so we had to really prioritize and we ultimately only sampled along the Shimong River um, in part because of its location, but also it had taken the largest amount of waste of the facilities in New York. So it made the most sense. And finally, now we um, are doing public outreach to try and um, make our results more available. Unfortunately, we don't have results for the creek bed soil samples. And that's, again, because of limitations in place on us and our um, collaborator at Pitt. So unfortunately, those aren't available yet. So one of the first questions that we wanted to answer was how much of the waste that is being produced is actually being sent to landfills. And we found that the majority, around 89% of the oil and gas waste 
the solid oil and gas waste produced between 2010 and 2020 has gone to landfills. In contrast, less than 0.1% of the liquid waste is being sent to landfills. The majority of that is reused on site or ultimately sent to injection wells. Um, but although it's only 0.1% that's going to landfills, that can still represent kind of a significant amount of waste. And when we looked at where geographically this, this waste was going, we found that about 75% of the solid waste was staying within Pennsylvania um, to landfills in the state. About 14.7% went to Ohio, while just about 9.6% went to New York. Of that more limited amount of liquid waste, about 45% stayed within Pennsylvania, 42% went to Ohio, and then 8.3% went to New York. And while New York is taking a relatively small proportion of the waste, when you look at the really significant amounts of waste that are being produced, it can still equate to a pretty large um, waste stream being sent to the landfills, even if it's not um, the majority of what's being produced. All of this data on the amounts of waste and where they're being sent um, is available through the Pennsylvania DEP's oil and gas waste report. Um, and we'll go into a bit of detail later on about where that information comes from and limitations of that data set. So the amount of waste and where it goes really does vary over time. The amount of waste coordinates most closely to how much oil and gas is being produced. Um, and it's varied over time where it's being sent. 2011 was kind of the peak year for the proportion of the waste going to New York, um, around 35% of the liquid waste, 25 plus percent of the solid waste. And it really declined for a period there. There was almost nothing being sent 2014 to 2019. Um, but you see kind of an average of around 10%. So your impacts are also going to vary based on when you're looking um, because it, you know, there are years where a lot more is being sent. So this map shows you the facilities that are accepting oil and gas waste in New York. You have Allied Waste Systems, um, Seneca Meadows Landfill, Highland, Hakes, and Chemung County Landfill. Um, Chemung County Landfill actually is two facilities. There's the Construction and Demolition Landfill and a Municipal Waste Landfill. They're on the same site, but they have separate permit numbers and file separate annual reports, um, but they are treated as one location essentially by um, Pennsylvania oil and gas producers. So that is a bit of a complication when looking at them. Um, you'll notice that these sites are also color coded with um, a related uh, wastewater treatment facilities, those WWTPs. And that's where each of the, the landfills sends their leachate for treatment. Um, the two landfills at Shimong both send their leachate to two different um, wastewater treatment facilities in Elmira, New York. And we did sampling around both to try and capture both of their impacts and kind of the collected impact that was going on there. So this shows you the overall amount of waste being sent to New York according to both the oil and gas waste producers via that um, PADEP oil and gas waste report, as well as the amount of waste that the landfills themselves say that they're accepting in their annual reports. Um, unfortunately, none of the landfills started recording the amount of oil and gas waste they took until 2010. And the documentation has not um, always been consistent. So some of the landfills didn't start um, classifying oil and gas waste as a separate category in their annual reports until years later, um, or did it intermittently. Um, and additionally, a number of them didn't document the origins of that waste. So it was hard to determine if I was looking at waste from Pennsylvania or within New York. Um, so I kind of had to also calculate what we would be comparing um, in the years that I had full data for the annual reports to compare against the DEP reports. Um, additionally, another complicating factor is that the Landfills report all of their waste in tons, while the oil and gas producers document their liquid waste in barrels. So you'll notice there's this 
kind of middle column where I've done my best to convert what those barrels are likely to equate to in tons, but that may not be accurate to exactly how, you know, the landfills are figuring their, um, their totals. What you see overall, considering the errors, considering the lack of data, and all of it put together is the numbers reported by the oil and gas producers to DEP do not match what the landfills are reporting. Even with allied waste, where I had complete data in both, you're looking at between a 22,000 ton difference um, if you're not looking at the barrels or potentially over 120,000 ton difference if you're considering what the barrels might equate to. Um, in another facility like Hake, where there's uh, much spottier data, um, again, you're looking at somewhere between a 40,000 and 100,000 ton difference in the total amounts of, of waste being reported. Um, even when you look at all the years combined and exclude the errors, again, you have somewhere between a 50,000 ton gap if if I've converted the barrels to tons correctly, um, you know, 376 versus 321,000 tons, um, or potentially more like 110,000 ton difference if you just do, you know, tons to tons. So regardless, there are some significant gaps between what's being reported to Pennsylvania DEP and what the landfills are saying they're receiving. And that is, um, definitely a potential reason for concern if you're trying to understand how much waste is being produced and where it's being sent. So in addition to looking at the total amount of waste and where it was going, we also did um, on-site sampling at the Shemung River. Um, as I mentioned, that was selected because the Shemung landfill has taken the largest amount of waste, at least based on what the oil and gas producers have reported. Um, we took samples both upstream and downstream of wastewater treatment facilities, and then we compared it against um, the state's surface water quality standards. Those are required um, to be created under the Clean Water Act, um, and the states designate certain um, water uses and then um, associated water quality standards. So we, it gave us a good basis for what we would hope to be seeing for water quality. And we found that all of the sites um, exceeded the standards for iron. Um, the site downstream of both wastewater treatment outfalls um, exceeded for both pH and manganese. And the site upstream of all of the outfalls exceeded for alumina. Um, an added complication with this was um, we were not able to access a site truly upstream of one of the outfalls on a tributary um, because of limitations around, you know, private property and access to those streams. Um, and it was also a little unclear where exactly this outfall was located, which I'll go into a bit more later, but um, there are challenges locating, not just at this site, but locating sampling um, because of issues with data as well as access to to waterways. We also took um, creek bed soil samples at all of these sites, although unfortunately the results are not yet available because of COVID restrictions. So in addition to looking at the cations and anions alone, we also did ratios, um, different you know, for example, magnesium to lithium versus bromide to sulfate um, ratios can be indicative of different potential contamination sources. In particular, we were looking for whether or not the water chemistry might resemble um, conventional or unconventional oil and gas waste or um, acid mine drainage. And what we found is overall, there was not a significant um, change in water chemistry from the upstream versus the downstream sites. As you can kind of see here, the downstream sites are marked in black and all of the sites cluster fairly closely together. There's not, you know, significant major changes in water chemistry, although there is some variability between sites. These are some more of those ratios. 
And there is a bit of a tendency for the furthest upstream site to be a little closer to mine drainage, um, but it's not significant enough to say that there's major changes going on. In addition to looking at the water chemistry, I also wanted to go a bit more into detail about the availability of the data and where we were able to access it. Um, as you may have noticed, one of our primary sources of data was the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection's oil and gas waste report. And that's compiled from um, information provided to PADEP by the oil and gas producers themselves. That information is relatively accessible. You can pull data for conventional versus unconventional, and you can go all the way back into the 1990s and sometimes the 1980s. Um, unfortunately, the quality of that data is not assured. The PADEP's form makes sure that there's something in there, that it's not just submitted blank, but beyond that, the DEP does not confirm the data. It's just whatever is submitted by the oil and gas waste producers. Um, and when comparing that data, even with all the issues with the annual reports, um, there are significant differences, um, which raise some concerns about the quality and the reliability of that data and limit our ability to make really firm conclusions based on it, um, considering those, those limitations. Um, looking at the annual reports, those are also relatively accessible. The annual reports from 2017 to 2020 are all available online. And the DEC sent me reports I requested within six days um, for all of the landfills for 2005 through 2016. So even those not online are really easy to get access to. Um, this is in sharp contrast to what we find with um, the Pennsylvania DEP, where it has taken months to get access to annual reports for 30 landfills just for 2019. So while there are major holes in the data set you can compile from the annual reports, it is pretty easy to get a hold of them. Um, one other kind of issue when looking at the availability of the data is the New York DEC does not collect together information on how much oil and gas waste is coming into the state and going to landfills. And I couldn't find anything where they collected information on um, where what waste within the state was going. So I was able to find out where Pennsylvania oil and gas producers report their setting waste, but that may leave out landfills that are just accepting waste from within the state. Um, and finally, we also looked at those um, NIPTES, the state discharge permits. They, again, are fairly easy to access. DEC has a um, Dropbox with all of their current and pending applications, but there are issues with the accuracy of the outfall points. Um, some of those points don't always fall in waterways or what you're seeing um, in person may not match up to what's reported on the permit. And that kind of raises concerns about how thoroughly those are being reviewed and if someone's really checking um, the accuracy of some of those things in the permits. This is not unique, I should note, to um, New York. I also was looking at permits from Pennsylvania and Ohio. Um, and these issues with the accuracy of outfall points were present across all three states. And the worst examples were not in New York, although they also had errors. So um, those problems are kind of almost endemic, I guess you could say, to these permits, and but definitely something of, of concern. And, and a complicating factor when you're trying to sample and trying to figure out where exactly to sample. Oh, sorry. So finally, conclusions overall, there are at least six landfills at five sites that are accepting Pennsylvania oil and gas waste, um, specifically Shemung, Haight, Seneca, Highland, and Allied. Um, the caveat to that is, of course, that these are um, locations that are accepting waste from Pennsylvania. Um, there may be a few locations that are just accepting waste from within New York, but I had no way to, to find those. Um, it doesn't seem super likely, but that is a possibility. 
Um, between 2010 and 2020, these six landfills accepted um, just under 597,000 tons of solid waste and 23,500 barrels of liquid waste. And that's according to the Pennsylvania producers. So that number might be higher um, based on what we are seeing in annual reports. There are, of course, inconsistencies between the landfill reports and the numbers put out by DEP, um, according to the oil and gas producers, and that confounds the accuracy of the data and makes it hard to get a really good understanding of exactly what the impacts may be. Additionally, inconsistencies with those um, discharge permits complicate finding proper sampling locations. Um, and again, also may be complicated in some cases to understand where the impacts may be. We didn't see this so much in New York, but there were some cases in Pennsylvania where the reported outfall fell nowhere near a waterway and it was a really small stream. So it was very hard to figure out what waterway may be impacted. So although that was not the case with these New York samples, that is a potential complication. Preliminary testing at the Shemung sites did not show evidence of contamination for oil and gas waste, which is really good news, but continued monitoring upstream and downstream of the Shemung site, as well as other treatment discharges is certainly warranted, um, and it could help pick up potential long-term impacts. Part of that being, it is important to continue and get results for um, creek bed soil samples, because those can detect um, buildup of contaminants that may not be evident in, you know, kind of a, a snapshot that you get with a water sample. There have been cases where um, sampling picked up buildup of radium that was not evident in water samples. So continued monitoring has the potential to really to find those issues. So I'm, that is, more or less our findings, and I'm happy to um, hand it off to the next person or take questions, depending on what's on the schedule. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I know that, so we're opening it up for questions. Um, so we did have one that was in the chat. So if you have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat. Um, the first question was, the Shemung landfill uses gamma detectors on their entrance. Will that find radioactive Marcellus shale drilling waste? Shemung landfill takes drill cuttings and says the gamma detectors never went off. Well, this is a, um, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, this is a common, you know, they, they, the standard gamma detectors for a landfill are basically the roll off, which is a large container is pulled into the, the, the detector. And then if they're above the threshold, whatever that's set, it will, um, you know, set off the alarms. But the fact of the matter is these are rather large trucks and, you know, it's not clear that, you know, the heterogeneity of, a, of, a, um, of, of the, the load itself will set it off. So again, and, and, and we also have to realize this, even if it's just under it and doesn't send the alarm off, we're talking about a cumul cumulative effect. How many loads and how much of this stuff is actually piled up in the landfill. Because as I said, for especially with radium 226, the half-life is 1600 years. So it, it's cumulative. And, and I'm not even gonna, you know, I mean, there's other potential ways of getting around it. We've had a situation in one landfill in Pennsylvania where the system was not working for three months. And when the DEP found out about it, they, had to have a company come in and do test cores to make sure that they hadn't exceeded. So again, it's just, you know, the, the question that raises is raised time and time again is, you know, who's watching these, who's doing and vetting the reporting and making sure that everything, you know, how often are these detectors actually uh, calibrated? So, you know, these are, these are big questions. And then when we get to the liquid waste, as I said, it's totally inadequate the way that they're testing for that. And yet, as long as those fluids are immobilized in one way, shape or form, like typically kitty litter or wood chips, those things are going into the landfill basically untested. 
This is Ray Vaughn. Let me jump in for a second on that question. Uh, it relates to what I'm going to be saying in a few minutes in my presentation. But one of the more fundamental problems with these detectors is that they assume that there is a secular equilibrium between radium and the lead 214 and bismuth 214, which is what the detectors are primarily detecting. So that creates quite a problem if there's not actually equilibrium uh, among those three uh, elements in the decay chain. All right, that's all the questions I see right now. I see that Bob um, has been posting some videos um, from disposal forums and um, just, I think, some overall landfill footage that folks might want to check out later. Uh, but if there's no more questions, I think we can move on to Ray's presentation. Um, oh, sorry, Kate, you're on mute. Ray has been working uh, a lot with the Hakes landfill. Um, we have been trying to um, deal with the ever present desire to expand and uh, the landfill and they're taking drill cuttings um, and we're trying to address the radio radioactivity of these drill cuttings. And um, currently the landfill is uh, trying to expand and um, again. And um, so that's one of the things Ray is trying to help the Finger Lakes group of the Atlantic chapter with. And so welcome, Ray. Look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you, Kate. I'm going to uh, shut off my uh, video here just to cut down on the bandwidth. I occasionally have a little problem with the unstable internet connection. I should also warn you that in a couple of minutes, uh, my clock is going to chime eight times for 8 p.m. Uh, nothing I can do about that easily. But also, I'm going to be uh, presenting a fairly short presentation, probably about 15 minutes, and then we'll move on to questions and answers. So uh, my topic is radium and radon in the Hakes landfill, also in the leachate and landfill gas at that landfill. How much radium and radon do we have and what's the evidence? And I uh, mentioned a couple of things. First, uh, I'm gonna be using just the word radium, but I'm referring to radium uh, 226 and radon 222 when I say radium and radon respectively. So there uh, are the other radionuclides, the other isotopes of radium and radon that need to be concerned about, but the evidence we have, the test results we have are specific to radium-226 and radon-222. As John has explained in his presentation, I'll go into it in a little more detail. There is the connection between radium and radon in the sense that radium atoms disintegrate or decay at a very slow rate into atoms of radon gas. So this is what the uh, two steps in the decay chain do to relate radium to radon. So they are obviously very closely related. Next slide, please. So we're going to be talking primarily about tests that were done on behalf of Hakes, the landfill operator, between 2012 and mid-2018. These tests show intermittently high radon in the Hakes leachate, consistently low radium, which is puzzling, in the Hakes leachate and evidence of high radon in the landfill gas. So in turn, these results uh, show that the leachate tests that were discontinued in mid 2018 need to be resumed. It'd be nice to have other tests done as well, but we particularly need the leachate tests that were discontinued in 2018 to be resumed. Also the landfill gas needs to be tested at the landfill flare to confirm the radon level and whether the radon level remains relatively constant or varies over time. And perhaps most importantly, tests are needed to reconcile the high radon with the landfill's waste acceptance limit of 25 microcuries per gram radium. Part of the problem that I alluded to just a couple of minutes ago is that these uh, gate detectors that are supposed to make sure that the uh, high levels of a uh, oil and gas waste waste load do not exceed the 25 picocuri per gram radium level. Uh, because of the lack of secular equilibrium, 
that is not a reliable test. You may also have noticed that I'm saying pico curies, uh, John said pico curies, uh, same thing. And uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is a table that goes into a lot of detail. These presentations will be posted online and I invite you to come back uh, later if you're interested in more detail than I'm gonna go, go into on this slide here. Uh, I should start perhaps by talking about the fact that uh, for measurements of fluids such as air or water or water-based mixtures such as uh, leachate, we are typically talking about pico curies per liter, whereas for solid materials such as local soil and rock, we're typically talking about pico curies per gram. So these two uh, different measures will be used uh, depending on the medium that's being tested. But as you can see from the top two lines, the levels of radium and radon tend to be pretty low in naturally occurring outdoor air and in uh, soil and rock in any given locality. There are some localities, uh, not in Western and Central New York, but some localities where this is not true, but, uh, but particularly for soil. So now you know what time it is. Uh, for soil and rock, there are a few localities uh, worldwide where there are definitely elevated levels of radium, but uh, not so in our local areas here. So let's move down to the last two lines here. Uh, in the landfill leachate, which is trucked away as uh, John and Lauren mentioned, the radium measurements are consistently low based on the test results we've seen. Yet the leachate results are variably high ranging up to 6,000 picocuries per liter at the time the samples were tested. And if you look at the footnote, it's way higher than that at the time of leachate sample collection. This is part of what uh, creates the difficulty of interpreting whether the waste that enters the landfill actually meets the 25 picocuries per gram limit or not. Looking then at the last line, the landfill gas emitted from the flare, uh, I should clarify that just to say that, uh, as you probably know, many landfills have piping systems that collect the landfill gas, bring it to a common discharge point, and it's usually flared or burned at that point. That achieves the purpose of burning the methane in the landfill gas, but the radon itself that's in the landfill gas mixture will pass right through. It is not destroyed by burning. So looking at the levels indicated by the Hakes leachate tests, uh, we can reach an understanding that the radium levels in landfill gas are probably low just because it's a solid. The radon levels in contrast are sometimes are always high, ranging up to what appears to be a level of about 1 million picocuries per liter, which is very, very high. I mean, if you look at the first two lines of this table, to get a sense as to how much greater 1 million picocuries per liter would be as compared to say 0.4 typical in outdoor air. Next slide, please. So here's the data set consisting of 107 leachate samples that were tested uh, on behalf of Hakes, the landfill operator. These are samples, go back please. These are samples that were collected between 2012, excuse me, 2012 and mid 2018 when the tests were discontinued. The top graph here and the bottom graph are both showing the same results with the difference that the top graph is just showing the progression from lowest sample test result to highest where the highest uh, result or actually the highest two samples tested at about 6,000 picocuries per liter. The lower graph shows the same thing, but actually in time sequence from 2012 to mid 2018. So sporadically or intermittently, the levels of lead 214 and bismuth 214, that's the ones that are being measured here. These are set part of the same decay chain as radium and radon. The samples of lead 214 and bismuth 214 are sporadically high, but range up to 6,000 picocuries per liter. At the same time, as you can see at the bottom here, all of these leachate samples, all 107, contained roughly 
five picocuries per liter or less, go back please, of radium-226. Very puzzling because these are part of the same decay chain. We're seeing in the daughter products of progeny, actually much, much higher levels of the progeny than we are of the parent radium-226. And one more point before we leave this slide. It may not be very clear on this slide, but for each of these 107 samples, there are actually two different bars on this bar graph. The blue bar is for lead 214. The orange bar that's a little harder to see is for bismuth 214. Again, these are both parts of the same decay chain. And what's important is that the measured levels in the samples that were tested by the lab that did the Hakes sample analysis, the levels for the lead 214 are reported as being very similar for any given sample to the results for bismuth 214. In other words, the orange bars for any given sample are pretty close to the same height as the blue bars for any given sample. So this is what you would expect if the test results are valid. And indeed, that's what we see here for all the samples. Next slide, please. Okay, sorry, I keep hitting the next slide. I was trying to move this bar down at the okay. bottom, but sorry. Okay, very good. So this is uh, what I've just been telling you of these 107 samples, uh, the lab tests show highly variable results for lead 214 and bismuth 214. Yet the radium 226 results stay very low at about five picocuries per gram, excuse me, per liter or less. Both New York State DEC and Hakes have raised questions about the validity of these tests, but there's really no sound basis for doubting the results. For one thing, the tests were done on behalf of Hakes by a certified lab. And we also find in the next two bullet points that for any given sample, the lead 214 test results are very similar to the bismuth 214, as I was just saying. That certainly shows that the tests are not showing any huge random errors. And the uh, also, we also have the fact for the low radium measurements, we see that uh, each sample was tested for radium-226 by two different methods, EPA method 901.1 and method, nine, excuse me, 903.1. Each of these or both of these would have detected higher radium levels if they'd been present. Yet we see these quite low radium levels of five, five picocuries per liter. Next slide, please. So I've been talking about lead 214 and bismuth 214 as being high in leachate. What is this able to tell us about the levels of radon, first in the leachate and then in the landfill gas? So the explanation starts with the radioactive, radioactive decay chain that John has described in detail. And I'm gonna show you this again. Next slide. You can actually see the decay chain here twice. On the left, the column starts with uranium-238. And you can see for each of these uh, members of the decay chain, the half-life starting with uh, uranium-238 at 4.5 billion years. But moving down the chain, uh, we get to the first red entry, the radium-226 at 1600 years. And from that point on, you can see the decay chain also shown in a slightly larger format over on the right, where from radium-226, we go to radon-222. And that, of course, is a gas, which is unusual. Other members of uh, this decay chain tend to be solids at room temperature. And then through plutonium, excuse me, polonium-218, and then down to lead-214 and bismuth-214 as the next two members. And it's these two members that we're now talking about, 214, lead and 214 bismuth that were directly measured in the Hakes leachate tests. And it's because of that that we can start to understand what the radon levels were in these samples that were tested on behalf of Hakes. Next slide, please. So you heard me mention secular equilibrium and we've been talking about decay now quite a bit. The point that should be obvious by now is that these various members, radium-226, radium-222, uh, polonium, which then fits in the middle here, lead-214, bismuth-214, 
don't just appear out of nowhere. You're all members of the decay chain. And as you've heard of referring to, uh, each atom of a parent radionuclide decays into an atom of its decay product, sometimes co called daughter or progeny. And as we saw on the last slide, the decay rate of a given radionuclide can be expressed as its half-life, which for the ones we're talking about particularly here is about 1600 years for radium, 3.8 days for radon, down to 27 minutes for lead 214 and 20 minutes for bismuth 214. And it happens that the worldwide amounts of these decay chain radionuclides follow a strict relationship that's known as secular equilibrium. In the uranium-238 decay chain that we're talking about here, the global quantity of each member of the chain when measured in curies or some other uh, curie-based measurements such as picocuries stays about the same as the global quantity of uranium-238. As I said, this is called secular equilibrium. Next slide, please. We can also achieve secular equilibrium on a smaller scale, such as in a sealed sample jar or a tight rock formation. In these instances, secular equilibrium is reached if the jar or rock formation remains sealed for a sufficiently long time. But where radon is involved, then it's very important to pay attention to whether some of the radon has escaped. Being a gas, it has a unique opportunity to drift away from its parent radium. And if this happens, the radium can be far out of equilibrium. It can be in what's called disequilibrium with its decay product or progeny. And that's the break that is apt to happen at the radon step where it is uh, evolved as a daughter of radium. Secular equilibrium, if reached, is handy, is very convenient. It allows the level or concentration of a radionuclide such as radium or radon to be determined for measurements of its progeny, such as lead 214 or bismuth 214. And coming back to the question about monitors or detectors at the landfill gate, that's the assumption that's being made in the operation and use of those uh, detectors. What's actually being measured by those detectors is primarily the strong gamma radiation from lead 214 and bismuth 214, and not the relatively weak gamma emissions from radium itself. But the problem for the detect detectors, and the point that is important in understanding what I'm presenting tonight, is that secular equilibrium is reached only if the parent and progeny remain trapped together for example, in a sealed container or tight rock formation, and they've remained together long enough to reach secular equilibrium. Next slide, please. So this is one of two graphs. Uh, they're both semi-log graphs. You see on the left, the vertical axis is, uh, is a log scale. And then we have a linear time scale on the horizontal axis. This shows how in a sealed container, secular equilibrium is reached uh, in about 21 days when the decay product or progeny is initially absent. So the curved portion of the dashed blue line, the decay product activity, and we're talking about here, radon and lead 214 and bismuth 14, they all track together very closely along this dashed blue line. It takes about 21 days when these decay products are initially absent in the sealed sample container. It takes about 21 days before they catch up with the activity of the parent, and the parent in this case is radium. So from 21 days onward, as long as the sample is sealed and truly sealed, not leaking, then uh, after about 21 days, you can test for lead 214 or bismuth 214, or preferably both, just make sure that they're matching as we saw in the Hakes test results. And whatever reading you get in curies or pico curies for lead 214 and bismuth 214 is a good reliable measure of what the parent radium 226 activity is expressed in those same units. 
So the general rule here is starting with nothing but the parent, the time to reach secular equil equilibrium is roughly five to 10 half-lives of the decay product of progeny. So with radon 222 being 3.8 days, uh, five half-lives of that is going to be a little less than 21 days. 10 half-lives would be more than that, but the 21 days is, gets you pretty close. Next slide, please. But the other possibility is that the sealed sample may contain much more decay product than the initial level of the parent. In other words, there may be a lot more of the radon in the sealed sample jar than there is in the parent. Why this would happen remains a bit of a puzzle. We know that radon can drift away from its parent radium-226. But given that truth, we also know that radon must be drifting towards some other location. And in that sense, it's certainly able to enrich uh, the radon concentration in a sample that also contains radium. Anyway, looking at this uh, chart again on the vertical axis, we again have a log scale. And again, we have the same sort of time scale linear on the uh, horizontal axis. So the question mark at the upper left end of the dashed blue line means we really don't know until the sample is tested how high the level might be of the decay products. Again, the radon and lead 214 and bismuth 214 will track together along this dashed blue line. But what we're seeing now on this semi-log plot is now a straight line, the dashed blue line that will gradually decline simply based on the decay of radon down toward the level of the parent. And the reason I put the parent at five picocuries per liter is that that's uh, what we've seen in essentially all of the Hakes leachate samples we had available uh, to look at from 2012 to mid 2018. So the general principle written out below is that if a sample has a higher level of the progeny relative to the parent, uh, the time to reach secular equilibrium cannot be assumed to be as short as five to 10 half lives. It may, for example, in this case, be about three times that long, about 63 days before secular equilibrium is reached. And from that point on, if we're talking about a sealed sample jar, all four of these uh, radionuclides will track together not just radon, lead-214, and bismuth-214, but also radium-226 will track together past that point, however many days it is. Next, please. So here's the same uh, chart. I've simply added the green vertical lines, uh, one marked collected, the other marked tested, showing the, uh, and these are 21 days apart, showing the levels in the highest of the Hakes samples at the time of sample collection, and then with the lower green line tested, the point of sample testing 21 days after sample collection. What we actually have the data for is the tested point on this uh, straight line curve. And we can simply work backward 21 days to know what the level must have been at the time of sample collection, which for these Hakes highest samples is around 270 picocuries per liter. Next slide, please. So back to this uh, perplexing problem of how can radon levels be so much higher in radium than the levels of, excuse me, so much higher in radon than the radium levels in the Hakes Leche samples. So coming back to what we keep saying, radon does just appear from nowhere. It's a decay product of radium. So even though radon is relatively mobile because it's a gas, the parent radium must be nearby. The only plausible explanation for what we're saying here, in other words, is that the parent radium somewhere nearby is contributing enough radon to produce these very high levels that were caught in the highest of the samples that were collected by Hakes and then submitted for analysis. The best available evidence 
is that the parent radium is in the landfill, but it's situated what we call high and dry, meaning that it's in the landfill, but not directly immersed in the liquid uh, leachate. If that's the case, some of the radon produced by this high and dry radium must then mix downward from the landfill gas into the leachate, thus causing the radon level in the leachate to range up to what I've shown you as being about 270,000 picocuries per liter at the time of sample collection. Uh, again, just for the highest, but certainly uh, a concern given that we had two of the 107 samples showing levels that high. So that's the story with the leachate. What does it say about the radon levels in the landfill gas? There are well-known principles about partitioning of a gas between a gas and a liquid, uh, in this case, landfill gas and leachate. The well-known principles of partitioning across the liquid gas interface between these two media. And that partitioning requires roughly 1 million picocuries per liter radon in the landfill gas to raise the radon in leachate to what we found to be about 270,000 picocuries per liter. Needless to say, testing is needed. I don't know how many times I could and should say this, but uh, testing is needed that so far, the landfill operator and the regulators have refused to undertake to the point needed. It's needed partly to understand the current landfill operations especially if expansion of this landfill is going to go forward, it's doubly important that testing is done to resolve these questions. Next slide, please. So here's just a cartoonish cross-section of uh, how the configuration may be where we have the radium being high and dry. The upper curved green line here represents the top or cap of the landfill. The white space below it represents the contents of the landfill and then the leachate is shown in blue below as a pool of liquid that's at the base of the, uh, the landfill body. And the little cartoon of a radium atom is shown at the far left. And then if you follow the curving red line, you get to a radon atom that is emitted from the mass of radium or the, I shouldn't say mass, it's from the concentrated concentration of radium in the landfill. And then these radon atoms are moving with the landfill gas and some portion of them will pass through the interface between the landfill gas and the leachate, ending up in the leachate at a level up to 270,000 picocuries per liter. This is, the explanation that fits the available evidence, but again, more testing, really focused testing to really understand what's happening here is truly needed to verify what's happening and show whether this is the correct model or not. So what does this say about the radium levels in the landfill? We've been talking about radon, but now coming back to radium itself, it's difficult to account for the high levels of radon in leachate and landfill gas if the waste acceptance criteria are met. In other words, if the trucks coming in contain no more than 25 picocuries per gram radium. And this is not just a question for today that matters for people living in this decade or century. This is a question that becomes important because uh, if levels of radon in a landfill's leachate and landfill gas are currently high, they're not going to decline anytime soon, given the 1600 year half-life of the parent radium. So it really is important to decide whether there is a lot more radium in the landfill than would be indicated by the truck entrance detectors that are showing no exceedance uh, based on the detector readings. Next, please. So wrapping up with this slide and the next one, the tests done from 2012 to mid 2018 show the intermittently high radon ranging up to 6,000 picocuries per liter when tested and about 270,000 picocuries per liter when collected. Combined with consistently low radium, which is showing up 
in all 107 samples as about, as, excuse me, about five microcuries per liter or lower. And the test then, based on the logic that I've been describing, uh, provides strong evidence of high radon in the landfill gas, which has not been tested, or at least if it has, results have not been made, made available to us, uh, that our evidence shows ranging up to about 1 million picocuries per liter. These results in turn show that the leachate tests need to be resumed. It really was a mistake to shoot the messenger, so to speak, to get rid of the tests that were showing these perplexing results in mid-2018. These need to be resumed. At the same time, landfill gas testing needs to be done. Doing it at the flare would be the obvious place to do it. In order to confirm the radon level and determine whether the radon level remains relatively constant or varies over time. And tests are needed of various types to reconcile the high radon with the landfill's waste acceptance criterion of 25 picocuries per gram. Next, please. So my last slide here are lessons learned or lessons that should be learned, and not just for Hakes, but also for Shimong and various other landfills that are taking oil and gas waste and perhaps other landfills as well. It's not really clear how widespread this problem might be. Testing some of the other landfills that are not known to have taken oil and gas wells may be useful just as a background level check. But in any case, radon levels in landfill gas need to be tested at the flare or other point of landfill gas emission at Hakes and other landfills. The obvious way to proceed is collect the data, understand the science, and then decide what action may be needed and not pretend that uh, there's a non-issue here. Second, the landfill leachate tests need to include at a minimum these gamma spec tests that have been discontinued for now. And this should be done in combination with independent or separate tests of radium-226. This last point about the need for independent radium-226 testing comes back to this question, which is going to be initially unknown with the collected sample. Are the progeny high or low relative to radium-226? Without knowing that, it's difficult to know how long a waiting period is needed before samples are tested. In other words, the waiting period between sample collection and sample testing. In addition, it may be useful to collect and test for uh, lead 210 and radium 222 as well, not just uh, lead 214, but also lead 210 and direct testing of radon 222. But for all of these purposes, wherever samples are collected, it's important or crucial, I should say, that the sample jars need to be properly sealed. If the caps are leaky, allowing radon to escape. Uh, you saw the slide that John showed, for example, testing in the headspace of one of the uh, commercial brine samples that he was testing. If he did not keep the sample jars truly sealed, he would not have seen such high radi radon levels in the headspace of those sample jars. So it's cru crucial that the sample jars are properly sealed. And last, the uh, high test results for lead 214 and bismuth 214. And also at least once in the Shemung landfill, where we saw one sample that was showing uh, around 1,000 picocuries per liter for both lead 214 and bismuth 214. These intermittent or sporadic occurrences of high or very high levels of lead-214 and bismuth-214 are too numerous to be dismissed as a fluke or artifact. They really are important sources of information, but in general, several additional types of tests are needed to figure out what's now going on at Hakes and perhaps other landfills, and especially to understand what the impacts may be from expanding Hakes. So that's it. I'm also willing to take any questions on my presentation or people may have others going back to what John and Lauren presented. Thank you. Thanks, Ray, and sorry that my task bar got in the way. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going through some of the, or Kate, did you have anything you wanted to say? Oh, no, sorry, you're on mute, sorry. Uh, I just also wanted to thank Caitlin um, for doing such a great job with the slides. Oh. Uh, 
we will go through some of the what's written in the chat. So the first one I see, um, could the waste have already decayed to the daughter products prior to reaching the landfill? And that could have just been answered as you were going along, but. Well, let me just uh, answer it. Uh, since what we're seeing are high levels of lead 214 and bismuth 214, that's proof that they had not decayed and they had such short half-lives that they're essentially instantly traceable back to high radon. Uh, so for the Hakes samples, uh, the high ones that were seen at the right end of that range of low to high, the high samples, you know, maybe 20% of the 107 samples had levels were higher or way higher than radium. So they had not uh, decayed down to a level that would be supported by the radium. And, and Ray, I just wanted to follow up on, on 1.2 that might not be clear. When we talk about half-life, it's not like if, if it, say the half-life was 10 days that, you know, or you started with 10, after 10 days, you're down to five. And after 10 more days, you're gone. It's like after 10 days, you're down from five to 2.5. And then after another 10 days, you're from 2.5 to 1.25. So the yes. stuff is all, all, always there. And, and that's one of the things too, that it's, it, uh, you know, this whole idea of half-life and decay, it takes a long time to get down to, you know, neutral, if you will. Yeah, as you are well aware, I'm sure John, uh, a rough rule of thumb is that 10 half-lives, uh, you know, two to the 10th power basically, uh, is needed before you get down to a roughly safe level. Even there, you need to look radionuclide by radionuclide. There was another question too along the, those lines. It says, could the radon in the landfill decay to solid bismuth and lead in the, and, sorry, and lead in the pipes of the LFG system and collect there? Then maybe the solids are washed into the leachate pond all in one slug? I don't know enough about the landfill practices to know whether that's a possibility or not. In other words, the first part of what is being asked the answer is definitely yes. Uh, some of the played out, some of the precipitation, so to speak, of the radon as it goes to polonium uh, and then to lead and bismuth, some of that will definitely deposit on the pipes. On the other hand, I don't know whether the pipes are ever flushed that would bring it back into the leachate. I rather doubt it, but I could be wrong on that. But in any case, uh, well, I'll leave it at that. There are a few more questions. I know we're at 8.30, but um, if you guys are okay, I'll, I'll ask a few other questions that are in the chat. Um, there is a series of ponds that have been contaminated by produced water or wastewater. The koi in the ponds have crooked spines. Is that caused by chemicals or the radioactivity? And yeah, John and Laura, that. that's probably a question for you. Yeah, I, I was gonna say that that's a biological question and it would depend so for instance, that we know that things like selenium ha can have uh, what they call teratogenic effects. But um, again, that's something we would have to know the, the usual suspects. But I think it, you know, in that case, it's probably chemical as opposed to radium, uh, radioactive. That's horrible. And then it says, in the Bell Vernon situation, what are the potential health effects, if any, should the people that drank the water from the water uptake that was a mile upstream from the treatment plant and mentioned by Dr. Stoles? Well, well, again, one of the problems that we have in our regulations, you know, we have this place called Three Mile Island. And so that's really, uh, and that's one of several nuclear power plants in, in, in the state. So that's really what's driven our testing. So they're looking for things like tritium and they don't have to test if you're not downstream from one of these facilities. So it turns out that the normal testing for radioactivity in uh, drinking water is once every nine years. And if you do find something, then that's bounced up to once every three years. And then once you're clear on that, it's just once every six years and then back to once every nine years because it's assumed there's no, there's no regulations on testing for T-norms in drinking water in this state. And I don't know what the situation with New York state is, but I'm, I'm sure I'm, you know, 
it could very well be the same because why where would you expect these t norms or you know the things they call them technically enhanced natural occurring materials because of you know the fact that they were brought out of the ground and they were concentrated and that sort of thing they're technically enhanced um that there's no there, there's lacking re regulations on this so again you know the the, the health um issues are known they're documented most of it again is is based on chronic exposure because that's what we're dealing with here low levels chronic exposure but um again it's just um the the data isn't there for what we need um will the regs developed out of the new law in new york block the acceptance of this fracking waste so, no if rachel maybe wanted I mean, I guess it's all hypothetical, but. Well, we, it, that, that certainly appears to be the very clear intention of the legislation. Mm -hmm. So we certainly hope that the legislation is implemented by DEC. Um, they're, they're about nine months late already. I don't think they've circulated any draft regulations or anything. So they're, they're slow walking this, but we hope they will enforce it. Um, let's see, uh, Joe Grinnan asked, how long do the tests take and how often would they be taken? Well, that's the approach we're taking in Pennsylvania. We want them taken often. Uh, but as Ray had mentioned, you know, to do it right, um, you need to get that secular equilibrium, which basically you're talking about at least 21 days in a sealed container. Um, but the good news is, is that there's a whole new um, generation of radiation detection based on silica technology. And I, I have this wonderful um, product that is an alpha detector that is designed to test for um, radon. And basically, you know, it's not the alpha, uh, it's not the rad seven, but it, um, the point is it gives hourly and, and uh, hourly readings because it's got four chips that detect alpha. So again, we're, we're going right now with, with some things. I also have a red eye, which is a gamma spectrometer, which not only gives you how many decays per minute, but also what the energy is. So that gives you some real time. And, and right now we're trying to, uh, you know, you know, uh, baseline that stuff. But the, the other issue is units. You know, your, your typical gamma counter is um, calibrated for millirems per hour, which is a dose exposure. It's an exposure rate. Whereas the, you know, the, the technical stuff is in picocuries. So again, you cannot directly go from picocuries to millirem or micro rim, uh, particularly well. So that's that's been an issue as well. There is just one last comment. I think maybe Lauren might be able to um, address this, but um, Bill Mattingly asked, we could not find the outflow station to the Lake Street wastewater treatment plant in Elmira that accepts leachate from the Shemung landfill. I thought it is required to disclose the outflow location. No obvious outflow location on Google Maps. Newtown Creek runs right by the wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, so um, there is information on where that outflow is supposed to be in their um, 50s or SPDES permit. Um, it is supposed to be, according to the permit, right at the intersection of Newton Creek and the Shemung River. Um, but when I was there, there's no obvious outfall, which was kind of one of my concerns is, that's where it's supposed to be located, but there's nothing obvious. Um, these outfalls aren't always obvious, um, especially if it's a small treatment plant, it may just be a small pipe. So that's where it's supposed to be, but it's a little unclear if that's exactly the correct location. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else has anything else, but I think that might be all of the questions that are in the chat. Um, very grateful for everyone for sticking around. <laughs> Thank you so much to our panelists and tons of information. And I'm kind of floored um, 
Thank you so much for sharing tonight, folks. Um, appreciate it so much. Um, yes, Patrick Sullivan says, thank you to everyone. Very informative. Um, um, I don't know how to just thank you so much. And Lauren, I'm sorry again for how badly I didn't say your name correctly. Um, I will also make sure that this, sorry, John, sorry. I was just gonna say one more time, I, I, this is being recorded and I do plan to post on the Atlantic chapters website um, tomorrow. It might just take a little bit. So I'm just going to post again, the chapters website in the chat um, that I'll make sure it's on the front page um, and folks will be able to watch if they missed anything. And I just wanted to thank the chapter for setting this up. Uh, I, we appreciate the opportunity. So, and thank you, thank all the folks that, that were here attending. Yes, thank you all very much. Thanks, well, Ray. Thanks, Lauren. All right, everyone, I hope you have a lovely evening. Bye, right, Kate, Caitlin, and Rachel. Bye, John. Bye, Lauren. Bye, Ray. Bye, Rachel. Bye. Thank you for the opportunity. Take care.